Good morning, welcome to the Vermont House Human Services Committee. Today is Thursday, March 24th. And this morning we are going to start our, uh, we're gonna have an introduction to S74, which is miscellaneous uh, amendments to patient choice at end of life. And uh, as a way of beginning, we're gonna have a walkthrough so that we know what's in the bill and then, um, we're going to have former representative Sandy Haas uh, talk about the history and talk about where we've begun and uh, all of that, because I thought it was important that we have a context. Um, and this builds on, on some, builds on on some level what we heard last week uh, from uh, the Vermont Ethics Network in terms of decision-making at end of life and care and respecting people's wishes. Um, legislative um, council. Uh, and Chief Legislative Council, welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Jennifer Carvey from the Office of Legislative Council. Um, I'm not sure if I've testified in person in your committee yet. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so I wondered, Madam Chair, if it would make sense. I, I wasn't able to stay for all of Cindy Berzese's testimony last week. Did she go over the law itself, the patient choice end of life? No. I think it may be helpful to do a bit on that to give context yes. to what the I think that, that would be excellent. Okay. That would be helpful. Um, so otherwise, we don't know what we're amending. Exactly. And it sort of jumps in right in the middle of... Uh, of some of the provisions. So it's difficult if you don't know what the whole framework looks like. So uh, just to orient you in the statutes, we are in Title 18 and we are in Chapter 13, which is entitled Patient Choice at End of Life. Um, and it sets out, there are a number of definitions, and um, but the main part we're going to focus on is um, the process set out in Section 5283. Um, and so this is entitled Requirements for Prescription and Documentation Immunity. And so um, I think Cindy talked to you a little bit of maybe about this, the uh, concept behind this law, which is to allow a patient uh, to request medication to be self-administered for the purposes of hastening their death. And the way the law it really looks at that whole process kind of through the, the prescriber's lens, the physician's lens. So um, that's important context just to know when you're looking at it that Section 5283, which is amended in the bill, says a physician would not be subject to civil or criminal liability or professional disciplinary action if the physician prescribes to a patient with a terminal condition medication to be self-administered for the purpose of hastening the patient's death and the physician affirms by documenting in the patient's medical record that all of the following occurred. And then it lays out the process, but it's really looking at it from the physician affirming that all of these steps happen. So first the patient made an oral request to the physician in the physician's physical presence, we'll look at that in the bill, for medication to be self-administered for the purpose of hastening the patient's death. So an oral request, and then the second one is no fewer than 15 days after the first oral request, the patient made a second oral request to the physician in the physician's physical presence for medication to be self-administered for the purpose of facing the patient's death. So one oral request, at least 15 days later, a second oral request. Number three is that at the time of the second oral request, the physician offered the patient an opportunity to rescind the request. Number four is that the patient made a written request for medication to be self-administered for the purpose of hastening the patient's death. And that was signed by the patient in the presence of two or more witnesses who were not interested persons, and that's a defined term in the statutes, who were at least 18 years of age and who signed and affirmed that the patient appeared to understand the nature of the document and to be free from duress or undue influence at the time the request was signed. So at this point, we have an oral request. At least 15 days later, we have a second oral request at that point, the physician offered the patient an opportunity to rescind the request, take the request back. And in this process as well, the patient made a written request for the medication and that was signed in the presence of witnesses. 
Number five is the physician determined that the patient was suffering a terminal condition and terminal condition is defined as an incurable and irreversible disease, which would within reasonable medical judgment result in death within six months. I know Cindy mentioned to you about the six months. That's what the six months refers to. So the physician determined that the patient was suffering from a terminal condition based on the physician's physical examination of the patient and review of the patient's relevant medical records. The patient was capable, was making an informed decision, had made a voluntary request for medication to hasten their death, and was a Vermont resident. Number six is that the physician must have informed the patient in person, both verbally and in writing, of several things. The patient's medical diagnosis, the patient's prognosis, including acknowledging that the physician's prediction about the patient's life expectancy was an estimate based on the physician's best medical judgment, and is not a guarantee of the actual time remaining in the patient's life, and the patient could live longer than the time predicted. The range of treatment options appropriate for the patient and their diagnosis. If the patient was not enrolled in hospice care, then information about all feasible end-of-life services, including palliative care, comfort care, hospice care, and pain control. The range of possible results, including potential risks associated with taking the medication to be prescribed, and the probable result of taking the medication to be prescribed. Number seven requires the that the physician have referred the patient to a second physician for medical confirmation of the diagnosis, prognosis, and determination that the patient was capable, was acting voluntarily, and had made an informed decision. Number eight is the physician must have either verified that the patient did not have impaired judgment or referred the patient for an evaluation by a psychiatrist, psychologist, or clinical social worker licensed in Vermont for confirmation that the patient was capable and did not have impaired judgment. Number nine, if applicable, the physician consulted with the patient's primary care physician with the patient's consent. Number 10, the physician informed the patient that the patient may rescind the request at any time and in any manner and offered the patient an opportunity to rescind after the patient's second oral request. The physician, number 11, the physician ensured that all required steps were carried out in accordance with this section and confirmed immediately prior to writing the prescription for medication that the patient was making an informed decision. Number 12, the physician wrote the prescription no fewer than 48 hours after the last to occur of the following events. The patient's request for medication, the second row well, patient, sorry, sorry, the patient's written request for medication, the patient's second oral request, or the physician offering the patient an opportunity to rescind the request. So again, in the timeline, we have first oral request, at least 15 days later, second oral request with an opportunity at that point um, from the physician to rescind the request, a written request, and then the uh, prescription written not less than 48 hours after the last of those to occur. Number 13, the physician either dispensed the medication directly as long as they were uh, eligible under law, so they were licensed to dispense medication in Vermont, had a current DEA certificate and complied with applicable administrative rules, or with the patient's written consent, contacted a pharmacist and informed the pharmacist of the prescription and delivered the written prescription personally or by mail or fax to the pharmacist who dispensed the medication to the patient, the physician, or an expressly identified agent of the patient. Number 14, the physician recorded and filed all of following in the patient's medical record, the date, time, and wording of all oral requests to the patient for the medication to hasten their death, all written requests by the patient for medication to hasten their death. <coughs> the physician's diagnosis, prognosis, and basis for the determination that the patient was capable, was acting voluntarily, and had made an informed decision. The second physician's diagnosis, prognosis, and verification that the patient was capable, was acting voluntarily, and had made an informed decision. The physician's attestation that the patient was enrolled in hospice care at the time of the oral and written requests or that the physician informed the patient of all feasible end-of-life services. The physician's verification that the patient either did not have impaired judgment or that the physician referred the patient for an evaluation and the person conducting the evaluation said the patient did not have impaired judgment. 
report of the outcome and determinations made during any evaluation the patient may have received, the date, time, and wording of the physician's offer to the patient to rescind the request for medication at the time of the patient's second oral request, and a note by the physician, physician indicating that all of the requirements for this section were satisfied and describing all of the steps taken to carry out the request, including a notation of the medication prescribed. And number 15 is that after writing the prescription, the physician promptly filed a report with the health department documenting completion of all of the requirements under this section. So again, the beginning of that section says physician is not subject to civil or criminal liability or professional disciplinary action if they prescribe the medication to the patient and the physician affirms by documenting in the medical record that all of these things occurred. And subsection B says this section shall not be construed to limit civil or criminal liability for gross negligence, recklessness, or intentional misconduct. There are also some other provisions in this chapter about uh, there's no requirement that any healthcare provider participate in providing a lethal dose of medication to a patient, and they cannot be subject to discipline, suspension, loss of license, loss of privileges, or other penalties for actions taken in good faith reliance on the chapter or refusals to act. Uh, there's also language. Um, oh, well, that's the main one that, we're, that we should look at. But And then there, there are others talking about healthcare facilities can prohibit physicians from writing a patient a prescription if the medication is intended to be used on the facility's premises. Some other provisions, including a reporting requirement. So I wanted to give you that context before we jump into what changes this bill is proposing to make. Do you have any questions about what the current law says? Okay. Thank you for indulging me in reading that. No, that's long okay. list. You. Helpful. We do have a yeah. we do have a question. Oh, yeah. Um, so when once you have the medication and you've gone through this whole process, is there any time limit on that? Like on um, when you have to take the medication? No, yeah, or if you have to rescind it or does the you it doesn't you can have it all in you can have it right so you get the if the patient gets that goes through the whole process and gets the are you talking about how soon they have to fill the prescription or how soon they have to take the medication yes how soon they have to no there's actually no requirement that they ever take the medication okay um there are requirements that the health department adopt rules providing for the safe disposal of unused medications, recognizing that these are intentionally lethal medications. Okay, okay. <laughs> but no, and in fact, I think you'll see, uh, I think the health department um, report, which they put out every two years, because you require that, um, says that there are some number of patients who have did not use the medication. Some of them died from their underlying conditions um, or other, other reasons. Carl. Thank you. Do we know how many people have uh, made use of this uh, mechanism? We do. Let me just pull up that report. Um, and um, as you pull it up, I, uh, the health department has uh, asked to testify um, and, you know, um, or ha has agreed to testify um, about their report, which has all of those um, details. So let me just send this current one to, um, I think it's on your website somewhere, but I'm going to send it to Julie so she can post it if people are interested in looking at that today. Um, but yes, what can I tell you? So for the most part, I think these are, oh no, this is the full time. So since there have, since the beginning of this law, since the law took effect in 2013, there have been 116 events, which I believe is um, in which people were prescribed the medication. Um, and it talks about the different underlying diagnoses. So uh, of those, 77% uh, were due to cancer, 11% were due to ALS, 5% to neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative conditions, and 7% to other events. Thank you. Yes. Um, and there's some additional information so in there about- Back in, two, two, you say, 2013? 2013, yep. That seems like a shorter time. That's it, I've got to do that In that time, only 116 people taken advantage of this. Right? That, I believe that's how I'm reading this 
that report. There are 29 over the last two years. Um, and I do think that um, David Englander from the health department will be able to go into more detail. And no, 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 this is important. I just wanted you to know that if there were things that uh, legislative council didn't have at the right. tip of her. Um, and then uh, one of the people who um, I've already um, reached out to uh, testify, um, maybe can talk about sort of what's happening nationally so that we know in context with that. Um, okay, so now we will turn to the bill. S-74 is an act relating to modifications to patient, Vermont's patient choice at end of life laws. And the first thing it does is makes is add some new definitions. And these definitions are added because they these terms get used um, as we go into further into the bill. So adds a definition of healthcare services, which is important because in the next definition, telemedicine, it talks about healthcare services. Healthcare services, and this is our fairly standard definition, means services for the diagnosis, prevention, treatment, cure, or relief of a health condition, illness, injury, or disease. And telemedicine is the delivery of healthcare services such as diagnosis, consultation, or treatment through the use of live interactive audio and video over a secure connection that complies with the requirements of HIPAA, the Health Information Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. So you, I think you've heard some on the floor already this year and maybe talked in this committee some about telemedicine and telehealth. Telemedicine is is one type of telehealth and it involves the that live audio video like Zoom. Now we're all much more familiar with what live audio video communication looks like, um, but typically for telemedicine, it has to be through a HIPAA compliant connection. So to, to provide privacy. Section two makes changes to that long section we went through on the requirements for prescription and documentation. So this, in, in the first instance, um, adds to the requirements first and, and second for around the oral request for medication that the patient have made the oral request to the physician either in the physician's physical presence and this would add or by telemedicine that live interactive audio video connection if the physician determines the use of telemedicine to be clinically appropriate. So the first two provisions here are adding telemedicine as an, as an alternative to request in the physician's physical presence. Further down in subdivision five, the physician determined that the patient and in subdivision A was suffering a terminal condition based on the physicians, and this would take out the language requiring a physical examination of the patient, it would be based on the physician's review of the patient's relevant medical records and a physician's physical examination of the patient. And then it keeps in was capable, was making an informed decision. Uh, subdivision D is just making a change for to use non-gendered language. So it made a voluntary request for medication to hasten the patient's own death and was a Vermont resident. In subdivision six, this is again adding a reference to telemedicine being <clears throat> excuse me, an appropriate uh, option here where the physician is informing the patient of certain information. This could be by telemedicine in addition to being in person. Subdivision 12 would eliminate the 48 hour waiting period after the last to occur of the specified events. The change in subdivision A is again to use non-gendered language. And the change at the end of subdivision B is changing an or to an and. I see this as a non-substantive technical fix. It really doesn't make sense or as much sense to say something occurred after the last of the following events, A, B, or C. It makes more sense to say last of the following events, A, B, and C. But from a practical standpoint, I don't think it has a change in meaning. In subdivision 13, we're again making a change to non-gendered language, um, which is just something we're trying to do throughout the statutes when, when gendered language appears. So this would say that the physician dispensed the medication, either dispensed the medication directly, provided at the time the physician dispensed the medication, the physician was licensed, et cetera. 
Uh, subdivision 14 is also a change to non-gender language. Change in his or her to the patient's own. Same in subdivision uh, 14B and E on page four. So, those are the, so the substantive changes then in this section would be to allow for the physician to uh, work with the patient through telemedicine rather than in per requiring everything to be done in person and eliminating that 48 hour waiting period after the last to occur of those listed events. Section three would add a provision to the existing section on limitations on actions uh, where it says that nobody is under a duty to participate in providing a lethal dose of medication and that a healthcare facility or provider shall not subject a physician, nurse, pharmacist, or other person to uh, any penalty for actions taken in good faith reliance on the provisions of the chapter or refusals to act. This would add a new subsection C saying that no physician, nurse, pharmacist, or other person licensed, certified, or otherwise authorized by law to deliver healthcare services in this state shall be subject to civil or criminal liability or professional disciplinary action for acting in good faith compliance with the provisions of this chapter. So there had been some concern, as I understand it, expressed particularly by pharmacists about their potential for liability, and this is um, taking a broader view, the language in the current statute looks mostly at the liability of the physician. So this is adding for uh, other healthcare providers as well. And, and then it renumbers the existing or reletters the existing subsection C to be subsection D. And finally, section four, effective date, the act would take effect on passage. Thank you. Um, in terms of the content, um, right now, do we have any um, questions for legislative council? Thank you. That's okay. very clear. Right over there. Appreciate it. But I just, I'm oh, yes. Sorry. I, I was just trying to find what I. Okay, uh, absolutely. And it was on page two, about two thirds of the way down. Suffering a terminal condition based on the physicians, and that's crossed out. I've got a review of the patient's relevant medical records and a physician's physical examination. What I understand is the major change there is it's not the prescribing physician that is attesting to this person's uh, issues, uh, life threatening issues. Is that right? Well, they are still attesting to the that the person is based is suffering a terminal condition, but it may be based on another physician's physical examination right. of the That's patient. Right. Yes. Prior to that, it had to be the, their their own physical examination right. of the patient. This would allow it to be another physician's physical examination. Can I ask a question about that? Oh. Yeah, go right ahead. We have a question. Uh, um, well, I just want to hear testimony about it. Sorry. Right. I, I just, yeah. I'm sorry. I just was thinking, like, um, is, is that because we have some physicians who um, do not wish to participate in um, this practice? That is not the testimony that I heard in the Senate. And you know, you'll hear testimony as well. It sounded, it had more to do with the patient's ability to travel to where the physician was when the, when the patient may be in an advanced state of disease. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and, and committee, this really is, this is, this is day one. Um, this is a, a complicated and um, complex. Um, and uh, Representative uh, McFawn, do you have a question for legislative counsel? Yes, yes, Madam Speaker. Uh, not Madam Speaker, not yes. <laughs> um, Please. <laughs> um, yeah. Just promoted you. Um, okay. <laughs> the <laughs> the uh, that that piece that uh, number five on page two. Um, yep. Does 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 an individual always have to have a physician's physical examination? So the determination that the patient was suffering a 
terminal condition must be based on a physician's physical examination of the patient. And, and not a telehealth. Um, Sorry? And not in that, that examination can't be done over telehealth, right? Right. So the physical, somebody must have, some, a physician must have performed a physical examination in order to determine that the patient is suffering a terminal or to diagnose the terminal condition. Thank you. The, the prescribing physician may have, may base in part their determination that the patient is suffering a terminal condition on the other patient's, uh, other physician's physical examination, but they must also have reviewed the patient's relevant medical records. Okay. Thank you. Former Representative Sandy Haas. <clears throat> How is your internet connection? <laughs> so far, so good. Um, I can always call you, all, all those sales are, or go black. Um, so I was asked um, to kind of put all of this in a historical context. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, this legislature has worked for years to empower patients to get the care they choose. Long ago, Vermont clarified that patients have the right to refuse treatment, even when doctors don't agree with them. In the 1980s, legislation facilitated what were called living wills and durable powers of attorney for healthcare. As a practicing lawyer, I helped many clients who wanted to finalize their choice of refusing to be hooked up to machines just to stay alive. My first year on this committee, we continued that work. Our advanced directive bill in 2005 became a model for the country. I believe you heard a lot about that last week from uh, Cindy Buzese. That legislation makes it clear that medical providers must follow the wishes of a patient or his or her designated agent. Two years later, Vermont implemented an online registry for advanced directives assuring that those documents could actually be located and used no matter where one ends up receiving treatment. Then this committee focused on palliative care. This was a field so new that many Vermont practitioners had not even studied it in medical school. As part of our work, we passed the first continuing medical education mandate in the state. It took us two terms to get that passed because there was so much opposition from the medical community. Now doctors must spend one hour every two years hearing about palliative care and pain management. In 2013, we took up and passed patient choice at end of life, which is codified in chapter 113 that Jen just talked to you about. That bill was intended to give patients one more tool to assure that they, not the medical establishment, can make decisions regarding their own treatment. Some will say that death is not treatment, but for a dying patient, the choice is not whether to die. The only questions are when and with how much suffering. Chapter 113 gives a last measure of control over the time and manner, manner of that inevitable death. When we drafted the law in 2013, we chose to model it on a law that had been used in Oregon since the late 1990s and in the state of Washington since 2009. Both followed a very careful procedure to provide that one final tool to a dying patient whose suffering feels too great to bear. In negotiations with the Senate, we found that not everyone supported that very careful procedure. As a result, we passed a compromise bill that forced us to reconsider that process at a later date. In 2015, we took up chapter 113 again and voted to keep in that careful procedure, keep it in place. Technically, that was accomplished by removing the sunset. Our 2015 amendments also required that the Debar Vermont Department of Health review the physician reports filed under the law and report to the legislature regularly on, on the use of chapter 113. So you've heard, of, you've heard about current law in detail from Jen. I will just go through it a little bit, a little bit more briefly. Um, it continues the multi-step process that was first adopted in Oregon in 1998. 
It permits a qualified patient to request a lethal medication that has to be self-administered. And that medication can be prescribed only if the patient is a Vermont resident, has a terminal diagnosis, is given a six month or less prognosis, that is six months expected life expectancy, and that that is confirmed by at least two doctors. And to be a qualified patient, you have to be able to make and communicate the healthcare judgment, healthcare decisions, not have impaired judgment, make an informed decision after being informed of the diagnosis, the prognosis, the range of treatment options, the range of comfort care options, the, um, the risks of the lethal, lethal medication and the probable results. And as Jen laid out for you, it has to be requested three times orally and in both orally and in writing. And there's that 48 hour waiting period between the last uh, request and the actual writing of the prescription. Partic participation under this law is voluntary. It's voluntary for patients and it's voluntary for providers. It creates a very narrow path for a dying patient who seeks medication to hasten their death. If that narrow path is followed, both the doctor and family members are protected from criminal liability, what we call in the law a safe haven, safe harbor, excuse me. Despite all our advances in pain and symptom management, we heard that there are always a few patients whose end of life suffering cannot be relieved. Chapter 13 was passed to assist those patients. And I think what you've heard about S74 is that it proposes a few modest changes to that very careful procedure um, that you will hear from other witnesses how that, how that would play out now. But we've had in place this, this multi-step process for many years now, uh, and um, and people who have worked with it have proposed those changes. And having read the bill, I support those changes. Thank you, former Representative Haas. Um, and former Representative Haas was, I think, the committee member who, for each and every, each of these sequential steps from um, physician continuing ed to advanced directives um, to reporting the, the first um, and initially on the house floor and then the amendment. Um, so she really, um, I think knows it this, this way. Um, and I thought it was important that we hear the history going back to what, what she talked about, which was, a long time ago in terms of thinking about palliative care and um, end of life and how how we can enable um, Vermonters to um, approach end of life um, in a way that works for them. Um, questions or comments or discussion? Yeah. I just, it's so, hi, Sandy. <laughs> I, um, I just find it so interesting what you said about palliative care and how the physicians were so against it from the Vermont. I just, and now it's the thing to do and people really are, our physicians encourage uh, the consideration of palliative care. So very, very interesting history. Well, it was a little pet peeve of mine that they, that, that, that radiologists said, well, I don't need to know about this. And my feeling was, you know, if I'm behind you in the grocery store line and I say, Dr. Jones, you're a doctor. Have you heard of palliative care? I didn't want the answer to be no, even though the radiologist was unlikely to ever use it in any way. I thought at least they ought to know what the word means. And I think I'll stop there, but I could go on about what I consider the arrogance of doctors. <laughs> what the arrogance? The arrogance of doctors, <laughs> <laughs> who we all love and adore, yeah. right. <laughs> and we really could not live without. I think somebody said that uh, all surgeons are really psychopaths. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Um, so, I happily, that wasn't a question. <laughs> um, 
Sandy, um, during the testimony that was given when this law was first enacted, I know there was a lot of pushback by the disability community um, as it relates to um, maybe, um, I guess what I would call substituted decision making. And um, so how, uh, and maybe this is a question for Ledge Council. So if a person has been determined incompetent by the court to make decisions on their own behalf related to health care, and they have a guardian, whether it be a public guardian or a private guardian, um, this seems to speak to the individual. And I just want to um, confirm for my own mind, because this happened before my time, that 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 means the individual, not the person acting on that person's behalf, if there is a guardian. That is correct. This law does not allow substituted judgment. Thank you. <clears throat> Carl. Yes, maybe you can answer this, uh, Sandy, for Alleged Council, but again, going back to paragraph five on page two, this change about the physicians uh, can be another physician, not the prescribing physician. How does that marry up with the fact that there has to be two independent diagnoses by two different physicians? Is that, does that mean there'd be two physicians that were not the prescribing physician or not? I understand somewhere in it says there have to be two diagnoses independent. Uh as, as I read that language, uh, and I will defer to others on the intention there, um, the, um, the, I believe that at least one physician has to do a physical exam, but there would still be a requirement that uh, another physician look at that, at, at all of the records. Look at the results, not necessarily perform uh, an exam. Okay. All right. Not perform a physical exam. Right. In person. In person. Thank you. Um, so, um, Legislative Council, um, maybe a different way, an, another way to ask that question How many different physicians um, does a person um, who is considering this need to um, connect with? At minimum, two. Okay. So at least two, there could be three or more. There, you know, there could be one physician who had performed the physical examination, a second who is the prescriber, and a third who is um, doing the medical confirmation, or it could be within those two providers, but never less than two. Um, Topper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the, on, on page three, the, we've taken out Sandy be 48 hours. Um, Madam uh, Chair, are we going to get, is there a reason why the 48 hours was taken out? Um, I will, uh, if she wants, I will let um, Representative, uh, former Representative Haas um, respond. We will be taking lots of testimony. We will be taking testimony from um, the supporters of the bill um, in terms of why and what was needed. What is the what is the problem that this is the, this removal is trying to um, address? And we will be hearing from uh, individuals who um, did not support the law in the beginning and who do not continue to support the law. And um, so we will be doing. So I don't know, I guess I'm saying, I don't know if um, Representative Haas can answer that or if um, Legislative Council, if that's a fair question for Legislative Council or we should wait. Uh, so I will just jump in and say that um, you will be hearing, my understanding from following this in the Senate is that, um, that this is exactly one of the areas where the what is, what is it now, nine year experience in working with this law as, as written, um, you will hear from people who have used it who will say that they are suggesting this change and why. So I'm gonna to defer to the people who have been working with the law. That's, that's what, what 
I used to do and what you what you do now is we take we take laws and we see how they're working and we make adjustments to make them work better. So we'll hear from somebody then, right, Madam Chair? Yes. And that's everyone, you know, I think this is this is an introduction. How's that? Um, and uh, <clears throat> Um, I think, on, you know, I, um, my understanding broadly is that this was to remove um, unnecessary barriers uh, for those individuals who wanted and continued to want to um, exercise their options under this law. Um, and we will hear, we will hear from those and we will um, hear um, we have an email out to uh, Mary Hans um, Beardsworth um, as to when she is available or whether someone else in her stead, um, and as she has reached out and we have reached out to her and she is someone who um, represents a constituency that has many concerns about this, um, about the existing law and the change. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Sandy, it was nice seeing you. Wonderful mm -hmm. presentation. I have to leave. I'm sorry. Please take care of yourself, Tucker. Um, other, uh, other questions right now for um, Legislative Council in terms of the content uh, or uh, Sandy in terms of the experience and history and what were some of the, or other things as it relates to how we got to where we are today. <sighs> so folks, this is, so um, let me lay out some ideas that I had in terms of who we hear from. Um, I think it's clear. But before I do that, who do people want to hear from? I mean, whether it's individuals or whether it is a constituency. Well, I think we probably should hear from the um, medical society again. Yep. yep. Um, and maybe some physicians who have actually participated. Right, actual doctors, yeah. I'm sorry, I can't hear. I was agreeing with her actual decisions who have actually um, okay. participated and people and families. people family members who have mm -hmm. been impacted. Yeah. Okay. The, the leader of a denomination of a church. I don't know what one it would be, but just to hear what the perspective from the religious community. Okay. Maybe more than one. Okay, we'll figure out how to do that. Um, and we have the health department. So we have right? the health department. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to circle back to um, Carl in terms of figuring out um, which are the, uh, the, the religious community is very wide. Um, and and, and, and uh, um, uh, I want to say probably the religious community being very wide has very different perspectives on this. and. Um, I might suggest to each and every one of you who has a connection um, and for whom their religious community is part and parcel and important to them that they check um, with, with them. And we will, um, I, I believe that Mary Hans Beardsworth represents a non, non, She's not necessarily connected to a particular denomination, but I think she represents, and her views are um, are, are rooted in a religious um, context. Don't she? I'd like to hear from her. Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and so we've we've got family members, um, um, some sort of connection to the religious community. Um, the health department. Maybe uh, what? Well, drinking and I had a lot at the same time. <laughs> no, no, okay, that's that's, that's challenging. <laughs> it is. It's very challenging. Um, 
employer, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, from the state probably. Just going over legalities. Okay. Which I don't question. But <laughs> well, I know that. But <laughs> I, I, I'm well aware. Okay, so since we're being this way, so I'm well aware we have ledge council. Okay. But on every other bill that has legal questions, we've had people from, um, you know, the um, Donovan's office or, or whatever. Attorney General. Okay. Attorney General. Yeah. Okay. You know, so I mean, okay. It's not a question of that. It's just that's what we do. Okay. Yeah. It's just, we don't get to pick and choose when we're going to do it. Okay. Um, I am, a, and now I'm turning. Yes, Carl. Uh, could we hear from some family members that may have had people exercise? Uh, good idea. Yes. Um, and and I know there are, um, I know that there are at, uh, several who have um, experienced um, this recently who would like to testify or who were, were, were offering if this is not too hard for them to testify. Um, I also um, have been thinking about there is a um, there's an organization in Vermont um, for people if they have questions, um, and as there is a national organization, so to have um, representatives from both of those um, groups. Um, and do you want us to hear from uh, the disability community again um, around well, this? Um, let me um, check in. Okay. With folks, okay. um, I, I, I know that the, the primary and big issue was around um, substituted decision making mm -hmm. and um, uh, but, pressure. Yeah, um, or family members or other people who are guardians of an individual with a disability making the decision for them that it's time, you know, for for their life to be over. And I think that that was. Uh, that was a quite a large concern back in 2013. Mm -hmm. It hasn't proven to be the case. And um, by not enabling substituted decision making, even if you are a guardian, I, I think that allayed a lot of people's concerns. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I will check in, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, I do want to um, put our witness on the spot, Sandy Haas. If you remember what, um, if you can, what some of the um, issues, if there were additional issues or concerns. Well, um, there was, and how, and how, and let me say, and then how we, how we tried to, how the law tried to address them. I, I think the uh, um, there there were there were concerns about family pressure, um, and and that was one of the reasons that we were so careful to follow the. It must be the individual deciding. It must be the individual um, um, self-administering the, the drug. Um, the there you know the the witnesses have to be people who are who are not. Um, uh, Interested in the estate of the uh, of the of the uh, ill person. Um, one of the reasons that we followed Oregon so closely was that Oregon had a track record that that revealed that many of those fears had not been realized in all of that time. Uh, all of the all of the concerns that we heard in 2013 had been raised in the 1990s in Oregon and, and they had been reporting right along and had found no evidence that any of those things happened. And I, I was just, I, did, I had, it's, I'm glad that you found the 2022 report from the health department because they don't have it on their website. Um, and I was intrigued to see that of the 29 people who, who, um, who quote, use the law close quotes in two years, only 17 of them actually use the prescription. So, um, so I think, I think 
on one level, the numbers by themselves um, reassure us that that this is not being abused. Thank you. I hate to be so ignorant on this, but I, I don't recall in the initial bill what the situation was with life insurance. In other words, if somebody choose to take their own life, then uh, they would not be eligible uh, or their estate would not be eligible to receive the benefits. Is that true or not true? Um, I don't know the- In the law? Oh, yeah, what's in the law? <laughs> yes. So in the law in ATVSA 5287, it specifies that a person and their beneficiaries shall not be denied benefits under a life insurance policy for actions taken in accordance with this chapter. So. I'm surprised our life insurance industry did not protest more on this law. Anyway, just following up on that. It's, no, a, it's, a, it's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. And we, that's, yeah. that's. Well, I think we need to hear from the insurance industry if these changes, I, I, I don't know, reading it, I don't know what these changes would do to make it, let's say, easier to or affect the possibility of insurance or not, but it might be useful to hear from the insurance representative, okay, life insurance. Just a thought, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. we're asking for suggestions. Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate that and, and we can figure out, I mean, I um, what the response um, is and um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I think um, a question that came to my mind uh, in hearing that not all individuals who are prescribed these medications ultimately take them is maybe hearing from a pharmacist or somebody like that. But my question is sort of what is the follow up in these cases of like proper disposal or retrieval of those medications after they're prescribed if somebody's not going to use them? Also, if we could hear from one of those people that decided not to take the medicine, it might be interesting. Okay. Well, they still they, died. They, 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 they still died. Yeah. They, they still died. They just stopped the medication. I mean, they're, they're, they either died. Um, oh, you think that's the main reason they didn't take it? Well, they, well, died. Well, chose, well, they chose to die naturally instead of. They, try, they, try, they chose to die naturally rather than taking right. something. Or maybe something happened before they took it. Well, of course, we also know even if somebody has been diagnosed with a terminal illness, it doesn't always mean it is terminal. Okay. But usually, as I agree with you. But. Um, a committee, my sort of thought about this is that um, this is the, I mean, well, this is Thursday, but we're not going to take any more testimony this week on it. Um, Julie, how are we working on next week? All of the witnesses for next Thursday. Okay, so they're witnesses for next Thursday, and they have been confirmed. Um, and uh, whether or not we have another day um, or a short thing is, is up in the air. And then we will um, direct more um, more concentrated time on it the week after. So that's um, that's why I want to know what what people's opinions and thoughts were. Um, so I think I think that gives us a, I, I hope this gives us all a good beginning and to begin to think about this and who we want to hear from and uh, know that it is one of the uh, Senate bills um, that we have. Um, we have two Senate bills right now and we'll be getting a few more. Um, and my plan committee is to have to have a walkthrough of what those Senate bills are so then we can um, figure out what we do next. And um, so um, with that, um, Representative Haas, thank, for, um, thank you very much. Um, for joining us today and for helping set the stage. Good day, Bye. Um, committee, it is earlier than, um, I, I wasn't sure I wanted to leave sufficient time for this because it's it, this is, can be a hard dis discussion or a hard issue. Um, but now that we have some time, um, rather than uh, coming up after uh, the, um, whatever we're doing, judicial retention. Um, how, I believe that uh, Representative Whitman 
I shared um, an amendment with you uh, on, on our bill. And so if you could present that yeah, if you have for, for, for a straw poll. Okay. Yeah, so uh, Madam Chair, yeah. I forgot my straw. <laughs> 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 we'll find one. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Right. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, so yeah, um, glad to hear back from quite a few of you that you had the chance to look at this um, last night. Uh, sent out an email after uh, a lot of uh, close collaboration with the Department of Vermont Health Access and going back and forth and checking with a lot of interested uh, people based on this uh, floor amendment which is essentially to offer alternative uh, policy moves around prior authorization. Um, I won't completely rehash it. I think a lot of people here know that uh, we gave an initial uh, proposal. Um, it, the potential costs associated with that were higher than we had anticipated. Um, and But in the efforts to continue on a path forward to address barriers to treatment, for people seeking medication assisted treatment. Um, there were a lot of proposals put forth to the committee and a lot of considerations about what uh, potential opportunities for changes there could be to prior authorization um, that would potentially make it easier for providers and patients to get the treatment that they needed. So basically the path that we're taking within this floor amendment is to um, task the department with um, sort of a deep research of all of the available and the, the feasibility, the logistics, the potential costs of all of these potential changes to prior authorization. And then for them to propose these to um, the relevant boards that are currently tasked with reviewing uh, decisions related to prior authorization. That's the Drug Utilization Review Board the Clinical Utilization Review Board. And then they will uh, provide recommendations after considering those that research, um, which will then be presented to us. So I'll kind of walk through um, the amendment right now. This is good practice for me this afternoon. Spent a lot of time uh, writing this and now we'll kind of do a, a walk through, but so, um, Let's see, I'm looking at the calendar, but it would be page one of the uh, amendments that I emailed everybody yesterday. Uh, the new section three of the bill uh, essentially uh, codifies the existing practice, which does um, exempt one medication within the classes of methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone um, from prior authorization. Um, and but it's just specifying that it goes through the Drug Utilization Review Board. So essentially, this was current practice, but it was not in statute. So we're codifying this current practice. It's the first section, right? Yeah. That's yeah. So this would be like a. It, it's read as section three, right. Because it's uh, within the bill as a whole. Um, section four is the report, um, which states that on or before December first um, of this year. Uh, DIVA will research the following, and we included um, specifying in consultation with individuals representing diverse professional perspectives. One of the reasons that we're here is that we heard diverse professional perspectives on uh, whether prior authorization is good the way it is <laughs> or needs to be changed um, in order to relieve barriers to treatment. Um, and we'll submit its findings to the DURB and the CURB for their review, consideration, and recommendations. And what we've ended up including for their research and following recommendations is quantity limits and preferred medications for buprenorphine, the feasibility and cost of adding monobuprenorphine products as preferred medications, as well as the current process for verifying adverse effects to monobuprenorphine, uh, three is how other states' Medicaid programs address prior authorization for MAT, including the 60-day deferral period that we've seen in Oregon, um, the appropriateness and feasibility of removing annual renewal of prior authorization, 
as well as the appropriateness of creating parity between hub and spoke providers with regard to MAT quantity limits. This says quality limits. <laughs> uh, so that's a Scribner's error, I guess. Oh, Scribner's. God, the person who wrote your report needs to. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, creating the, and then consideration of creating an automatic emergency 72 hour pharmacy override by default. So basically um, what this following section says is that um, the DURB and the CURB will include uh, this review as an agenda item um, at their meetings uh, related to prior authorization. Um, basically so that this is um, giving notice for public comment is essentially what this section says. And then on or before January 15th, the department shall submit a written report that basically contains that initial research that they gave to the DURB and CURB, as well as the DURB and CURB's recommendations. So that'll be coming to us for consideration of potential further action. Uh, seven is the reports. Again, these are the reports that would sunset. Um, now we're looking to renew them. And we've also bolstered them, uh, kind of. What, what was being sunset? I'm sorry. So um, remember when I would kind of read from that table that says like there have been three thousand prior authorizations yeah. and ninety five percent have been approved. Yeah. So those reports started in twenty nineteen, um, and they basically timed out after three years. Okay. So, so we're asking for extended. Yep. So we're renewing those reports as well as asking for additional data. Um, just so that it leads less up to interpretation. <laughs> Maybe uh, a lot of the questions that we were asking the department could potentially be answered um, ahead of time through this report. And so um, what the report will include is which medications required prior authorization, the reason for initiating prior authorization, that would be a new point. Um, like why was this medication uh, why did we have prior authorization now and not for the other 10,000 times uh, this prescription was prescribed? And then um, how many prior authorization requests the department received and of these, how many were approved and denied? Um, that was already included, but we also want to include the reason for approval or denial as an additional data point. Um, the average and longest length of time the department took to process a prior authorization that was already there and how many prior authorization appeals the department received and of these how many were approved and denied and the reason for approval or denial this is a new piece within the statute our understanding is that the department already was presenting this data um, so and that's that cool so yes I, I just wanted to mention to folks that i know we had talked about the corrections thing yesterday and I did um, reach out, uh, meaning um, folks who transitioned from correctional on MAT and then moved to, to the community uh, and have to sort of immediately switch over if they're able to get immediate access as it is. And um, so the chair of the joint, so I sent a note to the chair of the joint justice um, committee to see if she would take that up during the off session and she um, responded that um, we will take that up during the off session so we'll take additional testimony on that issue and you know potentially bring back um, some recommendations for consideration next year yes. and the joint justice committee yes. Yes. Um, i told her i'd wait for her thing to print out but it wasn't didn't print and it wasn't in the queue whatever she was looking for oh okay <laughs> Um, just for folks, the justice oversight is one of the summer or interim um, joint committees, and it uh, has members, um, the, the chair or designee from institutions, from uh, health, from human services, from judiciary, and I don't know. If that, that's, that's it. Three. And um, in both the Senate and the House. And uh, Right. And, I, and I'm the rep for human services yes. in the house. Great. Um, so before we, um, thank you for that update. Um, before we vote on your amendment, um, 
Topper had, um, and he's, he, had to, he had to go away, but his, his, his request, and he has, he, he has sort of emailed that he's okay, um, was that we needed to know the amend, what our amendment was before we voted um, on, uh, before we took a straw poll on accepting the Appropriations Committee amendment which is what started this whole thing because mm -hmm. they they uh, sure. they they struck everything about pre authorization. So um, let's first do a straw poll on the appropriations committee amendment to our bill. All those who are in favor of the appropriations committee amendment, please raise your hand. Okay. Um, so um, it it's something one zero. Opposed. Sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. Those opposed. What? I'm sorry. I, you know, <laughs> I why does that mean? Um, just oh, yeah. wanted to vote, so I know she had to run, but okay. So um, it is a straw poll. It is a straw poll, so you can. Um, uh, I could text her. She said. Yeah. Okay. Um, you can. You can text, text her. her to tell her to come back. I don't know where she went, but. Chopper on it. Chopper on yes. on this too, and so I. So what we will. Um, Topper gave his um, approval in um, in an email that the amendment was okay with him. But uh, when he gets back, um, I will. Which amendment one? The appropriations. No, he, well, he gave his approval of yeah. of the second amendment, okay. not the first. Um, he didn't not give his approval, but we didn't ask that specific question of him. So I will, um, when he gets back, we will circle back to him. So, as of now, I have eight, one, two, two absences. Right, right now, you have eight, one, two, and it may, um, that may change, and it being a straw poll, sometimes a straw vote, sometimes it, by the end of the session, these straw votes happen on the floor of the house with someone going from either the committee, <laughs> they huddle in the corner, huddle in the corner <laughs> um, on that kind of thing. So, um, we're not really diverting too much from process. Um, and so now, um, uh, and a, um, a straw poll on accepting the amendment as proposed by um, Representative Whitman. And all those opposed? Uh, so that is um, nine zero two mm -hmm. until we hear from um, other people. So thank you very much. I don't think we'll have a reason to come back. Well, we'll have the opportunity to um, come back today. I think we have a long day on the floor. Um, I'm gonna text you. I mean, we do have a bill on the floor. So sometimes um, there may be an amendment or something. So think about um, potentially being here at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Um, if not um, on Friday, 15 minutes after we get off the floor. Um, and I will, I will confirm um, that text and email to everyone um, about Friday. Okay, as far as committee. Uh, right, as far as whether, whether. Possible committee. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Well, um, um, I, given where we are and everything, um, I think we, we will need to check in at least for, you know, 45 minutes and whether that is um, first thing in the morning in case there's an amendment to the bill or something like that, or whether it is when we get off the floor, um, and when I look at the, uh, when I look at the calendar, um, the only what we have um, for first reading on Friday is the capital bill, and um, then everything else looks like it will be third reading. So. Um, if we do, if we, so I, I met, so if we don't come first thing in the morning, we'll do a quick at the end, you know, because I don't, we won't be, we won't be till four o'clock on on the floor on Friday. We don't have any witnesses, tomorrow. and we don't, we don't have any. This is just to um, yeah. to check in um, and uh, that. So um, with that. Uh, we have a few minutes before we are going on the floor. So this ends our.